Monica. If, yes. Hi, hi, welcome to today's uh, school seminar and thank you all for your attendance. And please give a warm um, welcome to Rebecca, who is a um, research fellow in the Computer Science Educational Research Group. And Rebecca's research interest is in the area of STEM engagement, computer science education, and technology enhanced uh, learning. And Rebecca leads, um, together with Katrina and Louis, the digital uh, cash program and numeracy and mathematics that is worth uh, more than two million dollars for the university. And please, um, if you may, um, Rebecca, share your screen. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aneta. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit of what we're doing in the Computer Science Education Research Group. Um, so I thought this session um, to focus on uh, K-12 and tertiary level uh, computer science education and how we're working to support um, teachers to improve pedagogy, access, equity and engagement in schools. Um, so I thought I'll present an overview of some of the project findings in our research stream around the K-12 and tertiary space, um, as well as more broadly some of our STEM engagement work. And it's really a culmination of um, work bringing together education theory, learning sciences um, and computer science um, techniques that help us to understand and advance learning and teaching in computer science. So it's looking at the development of tools, but also that deep learning, um, how we can improve the field in learning and teaching. So today I'll walk you through some of our research activities. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd just go through them all. And then if something interests you, you can ask questions at the end um, or feel free to come and speak to any of us in the research group as well. So before I begin, I'd like to um, acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the land on which um, we work and live. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be here today or watching online and also pay my respects to your elders past, present and emerging. So we have a team of researchers working in CS education and um, together we are all really passionate about inspiring people in computer science and really improving learning and teaching as well as um, exploring novel ways of developing tools for CS education and techniques of understanding um, how we can better understand learning and teaching online. So um, we all have different areas of expertise, but the beauty of it is that we can all work together and collaborate on diff different types of projects. Um, I've got my colleagues here on the screen and um, today I'll be touching on some of the research projects, but mostly like the ones that I'm involved in, um, because I think that they deserve their own spotlight for some of the work that they're doing. Um, my role in the group, I'm a learning scientist and I'm an interdisciplinary research researcher and I've been working with the CESA group for over eight years now um, across various projects and with my colleagues. So our CESA research, we look at CS education pedagogy at the K-12 and tertiary level. Um, this includes things like curriculum design, learning and teaching strategies and how we assess learning. Uh, we also look at technology enhanced learning, so how we can design online environments, particularly scalable learning environments. We look at online learners and their engagement and behaviour. We also consider um, online learning pedagogy and learning design for effective learning and teaching. We also have a, a broader mission and an interest in STEM engagement. We know that if we're able to inspire future generations and support teachers to engage students in STEM that we can then see that um, come the students coming through into our, our degrees and programs because you know we want to see a more diverse STEM workforce and this includes looking at trends and what we understand about what engages and disengages students as well as inclusive learning and teaching and classroom strategies 
And um, lastly, but not least, um, another area we look at is CS techniques applied to the domain of education. And Dushari is one of our leads, um, for example, looking at natural language processing and how that can be a technique to help us um, analyze the, the research data that we have, as well as to improve um, tools for this space. Um, and I've done some work with her that I'll um, share with you. So the learning sciences, I guess, like, why am I in a school of CS? Um, I come with the expertise in the learning science area and learning science is interdisciplinary. So uh, what it does, it combines research, data and practices that help educators teach better and uh, students to learn more effectively. And the goal of the learning sciences is to really understand the nature of learning from a variety of perspectives and to shape the way that learning environments and resources are designed and used. And um, what we try to do is bridge that divide between research and practice. So, you know, it is that theoretical research, but then it's also that practical component to advance the field. And it can include looking at, um, you know, learning and behavior of the individual, uh, their interaction with the physical, social and cultural world, as well as those interrelationships um, between them. And um, you know, research in learning sciences could be conceptualized along a, a continuum. So from the microscopic, looking at the learner, the individual, um, their skills, self-efficacy, uh, their cognition, uh, the emotions that they bring to the learning space and uh, the way they might regulate, self-regulate their behaviors up into things like um, the macro system, which is looking at those broader cultural attitudes, looking at education systems and their impact on um, other layers of systems and the down to the individual. And so at the heart of what we do is to really understand how all of this impacts on the learner and how we can improve learning processes and experiences. So if um, you've ever walked past Nick's door, you may have seen um, this wonderful uh, poster on there. Um, it's, I'm not expecting you to read them all, but I just wanted to show you that there are many different lenses um, as learning scientists that we can draw on. So there are many learning theories from different scientific disciplines, such as psychology, education, philosophy, and um, there are many theories of learning and paradigms that can help inform our understanding of learning and teaching and the development of research studies that are, are rigorous. And so some of these are well established and they've been around for many um, decades, but then there are new theories that are emerging and this could be with um, things like the emergence of new technologies. We're now seeing connectivism as a new theory, the idea that people are connected and, and learning online but also those more traditional theories are still very relevant and we can bring them across to help to understand these um, new environments, new ways of learning. And so I bring these learning theories into the work that we do, whether it be um, analyzing online student interactions or designing new online modes of delivery and um, having those frameworks, uh, they really help ground the research and help formulate it so that we're able to really advance um, the theoretical understanding of learning and teaching. I've always had an interest in technology enhanced learning. And so um, drawing on my background, in my honours thesis, I looked at student and teacher interactions and experiences with, with interactive whiteboards and that pedagogy behind that engagement. And then in my PhD thesis, um, I continued that stream of using technologies and looked at uh, how students used emerging technologies, which at the time was um, social network sites uh, like Facebook to support their informal learning experiences. So my work, my work drew on educational psychology, looking at self-regulation as well as social constructivism and how learners are interacting and engaging and sharing knowledge um, together. And through that, I discovered, you know, that even though students are frequent users of technology, that doesn't mean um, that people know how to harness those same technologies. And we recognize that in the research we do in CESAR. So we're really trying to help teachers and learners in the space um, use technologies effectively. Um, we also found that uh, social network site activity mirrored academic life and that social networks can create that sense of belonging and academic support 
and that those highly connected in, within these kinds of communities had an advantage um, in their learning experience. Um, and that there are particular skills, knowledge and identities that we really need to develop to help people make effective use of technology as well as to um, become effective learners within these environments. And so that's um, within the environment of social network sites, but today it could be, um, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, Discord, or many other uh, areas. And so I've been lucky to be able to draw on my background in educational technology to come and work with um, computer scientists on new problems and new learning environments. So the strength of being in a, a learning scientist role is that my work is interdisciplinary and um, I've just thoroughly enjoyed being able to work with computer scientists to really bring the expertise together. And I think that's the strength of our group, being able to you know, draw on Sashari's leadership in natural language processing, um, Katrina and Nick's active learning um, pedagogies, and we, we kind of all work together. So what is the landscape in CS education that we're working with um, that motivates our work? So our landscape, you know, we're looking at 75% of future jobs requiring STEM capabilities. And we see that in high schools, 70% of males um, select STEM subjects and only 32% of females are choosing at least one STEM subject. Um, in terms of computing, we're seeing, you know, about 16% of young people are choosing those pathways, but a very small number of those are women. Um, we see within the research that children as young as the first year of school are already coming in with these preconceived ideas about careers and ability in technology. So young children are, are already thinking that um, boys are much better at programming and using robots than girls. Um, and they're, when they come to draw um, computer scientists, it's usually that the stereotypical computer scientists um, until they're exposed to a diversity of learning experiences. And so we're seeing that teachers and peers play a really critical role. Uh, and this is reported in research with 30% of friends um, and 24% of teachers being cited by young people as key influences in their decisions to choose STEM pathways. And we've also found that in research, um, you know, teachers are more likely to encourage boys in computing roles um, and that impacts on their decisions to uptake computing careers. So we really want to think about this as an, you know, an, eco an ecosystem. We're looking at the macro and the micro level in order to in, um, increase participation and engagement. So, I've got a couple of graphs here on the screen as well. And we're seeing that there's a trend of growing enrollments from international students, um, pre-COVID of course, like the data was taken, um, but not such a drastic change amongst domestic students and particularly within um, the female cohorts. So we still have a real, you know, although there's amazing initiatives and uh, you know, increased awareness around the value of technology careers, there's still a lot of work to do. And, um, that's sort of what builds our momentum in the, in the research that we're doing. So we've looked at um, into understanding how we can help students become better learners in computer science. Um, you know, we know that if we are able to build their skills as learners, um, you know, they're able to have a toolkit to approach computer science in a way that you know, they're effective problem solvers, they have a level of persistence and resilience when they're encountering their learning experiences. Um, and one of the first projects we did was to look at final year programming students um, and they had a focus on design strategies. And as part of that course, they were asked to um, create learning reflections and send in their design strategies. And so we performed some analysis on this using the Piaget um, stages of development, which looked at um, pre-operational, which was kind of um, magical thinking, um, that kind of like egocentric idea, then moving into concrete operational where they're starting to um, see patterns and start to form abstractions. And then the idea of formal operation, which is um, a student who is, you know, reflective, thinks about the whole process, and is able to see complex relationships between how things work 
And so our goal in looking at this was to, you know, you'd hope to see that students are moving up into that formal operational stage. Um, and so what we did was we took their essays and we were coding them and looking at evaluating their design strategies and then also looking at things like their grades. And we've got here on the screen, um, just looking at their performance. So what we're doing is trying to understand the metacognitive processes. So they're thinking about thinking um, and to understand how that translates into the products that they're producing um, in their learning. We also took another angle of this um, and looked at uh, growth mindset. So we know that growth mindsets are incredibly important for maintaining persistence and resilience in computer science. And so we looked at using Weiner's um, causal attribution theory. And this is um, a way of thinking about success and failure and how people attribute success and failure to certain um, circumstances. And so we looked at their essays and in the essays they were asked to reflect on, you know, what what they felt um, caused successful or unsuccessful outcomes or where areas that they could improve. And um, we were able to look at those different strategies and sort of pinpoint perhaps problematic areas that we would like to um, grow. So in this one, we can see that some students are saying um, their personality was um, due to unsuccessful outcomes or teachers um, or the fact that it was the task difficulty or the marking criteria. And those things are quite fixed. And so students can't feel like they have a sense of control over that. And so we really want to think about how we can help students um, see their role in their learning process and to um, harness things like design strategies as um, a way to have control over those processes. So we can see um, that some of the successful outcomes also were attributed to some uncontrollable factors like luck. They just thought they got lucky in their programming assignment. Um, uh, but then you can see some controllable factors such as time management, having a good design strategy, effort, social interaction. So perhaps reaching out and seeking help. And so um, these are the kinds of things that we're interested in that can inform um, pedagogy. So in practice, we can see that um, we've got some recommendations around this, around the value of engaging students in that reflective thinking process, um, looking at, and this can be adopted through, uh, you know, reflective essays or questioning, or even um, asking students to discuss and self-evaluate in the moment. Um, and this is valuable for the student, but also the teacher in bringing to life some of those thinking processes and how you might help them. Um, we also look at you know, the challenges in some of those attributions, so areas that might be problematic and think about how you could, we could design curriculum to scaffold them. Um, and we, we think that dis discipline specific strategies from CS, like looking at good design practices and embedding that early on in their degrees is one way to help students have control. We've also um, have an interest in looking at online learning and we know that online teamwork is very important um, in the field of computer science. Many um, projects require people to collaborate online in distributed environments and some early work that Nick led uh, in a computer science course was to use Piazza as a way to have students um, perform teamwork and collaborate on a single solution together and we sought to understand if um, that was an effective pedagogy, as well as to look at how we could analyze it and to understand teamwork and collaboration in those online environments. And so we did, we looked at different um, models and theories of teamwork and looked at met research in metacognition and frameworks to help us build a, a framework for manual content analysis. And we explored the data in different ways. So we looked at team roles that emerged, as well as their cognitive learning processes and met metacognitive thinking. So they're thinking about learning processes. And um, through that, we were able to identify different types of roles that students were adopting and um, how that sort of related to the performance within groups as well. So building on that, a challenge of that kind of 
there's an advantage in that analysis in that it illuminates what's happening in these kinds of online learning environments but there is a challenge in being able to um, scale that and have that kind of information readily available for instructors so that they can intervene if it's necessary or perhaps to understand how they can improve um, the next assignment for example and so um, what we noticed was that um, those behaviours mirrored problem solving activities. There was evidence of students in those environments peer tutoring and reviewing um, each other's work and they were engaging that metacognitive and cognitive process. But that within these environments, both active and passive roles were really important. And so through that manual analysis and those findings, we were able to build a dashboard that was automated and able to take in students' contributions and then present it in this dashboard view, which was um, created by Hamid Tamazadi, and um, he's one of our current PhD students as well. So moving on, we're also interested in looking at how students are learning in um, new online spaces. So at the time, we were quite interested in the emergence of this new scalable model of online learning, um, which was MOOCs, so Massively Open Online Courses. Um, and we want, wanted to explore this as a platform to explore different computer science pedagogy, but to also understand how learners um, engaged in these online environments and how we could improve learning in them. Um, so at the time, a number of MOOCs were emerging around computer programming, but the research really focused on reach metrics with limited work looking at the pedagogy of MOOC design as well as the pedagogy of online computer science. And so our approach was designed to design a MOOC founded on a research around effective computer science education. Um, we drew on media computation, mastery learning practices, um, the use of Parsons problems, as well as social learning opportunities. And so all of these kind of came together in um, a way that we designed this online course that had students learning about how to program um, using drag and drop Parsons problems, as you can see on the far right on the screen here. Um, but we really wanted to um, scale out support in terms of feedback students receive. So on these, in these online environments, it's really difficult for instructors to individually provide feedback on a programming assignment and the development of it. So we built a, a gallery where students had their own private studio and then they were able to share their final artworks into a public gallery space and then receive feedback. So we're really thinking about how we could harness that peer-to-peer -peer learning and that uh, social constructivism model um, into this type of MOOC. So we performed an analysis on one of our first cohorts. So we had 20,000 students in our first release. And we did find that within our analysis, 30% um, were female, which is a little bit higher than the usual cohorts at around 20%, um, which suggests that perhaps media computation was a, um, a way to engage females in computer science programming within you know, an online um, public course for anyone to join. And what we noticed is um, we had students submitting their assignments. So a lot of them were also submitting working in their private galleries. Um, so we had 14,000, 14 and a half thousand artworks in the private galleries and two and a half thousand students submitted about seven and a half thousand artworks to the public gallery. Um, but what we wanted to do was to look at how um, how the course design impacted on their understanding of key concepts. And we did notice that there were some patterns that were repeated. So um, when students were first introduced to new constructs, they did revert back to um, previous concepts that they'd learned. And so this helped us see that um, it was really important to scaffold the integration of context, uh, con concepts so that students had repeated opportunities to practice them and integrate them together rather than as isolated um, concepts. And so this foundational work is now used as a blended mode um, as part of the University of Adelaide introductory programming course and key learnings from this work has been taken on into that program. 
Rita Garcia has also furthered this work in her PhD thesis recently, and she's contributed to the design of um, the introductory programming course materials moving forward. So in her work, she explored various scaffolds in introductory programming courses, looking at enhancing assignment design, the use of effective questioning techniques, and um, Parsons problems focused on the design level aspect as a way to scaffold students and really engage them in that design process. And um, through that, she noticed different types of problem solving methods emerged such as experimenting personas, top-down personas, um, students looking at what they knew first. Um, and it's a really interesting way um, to be able to understand learners um, and to experiment with different types of problems that we can give them. And through these techniques of analysis, an analyzing those behaviors, we're able to improve um, learning outcomes. And Nick, um, Nick, Katrina and I are also uh, leading some work around looking at MOOC assessments. So looking at meaningful assessment in online MOOC environments within computer science. And so, you know, we're really wanting to understand how we can move beyond uh, multiple choice questions. What are some um, innovative ways that we can assess student learning at scale, um, you know, with some level of efficiency as well. So now I thought I'd move into, um, so we taken a path of looking at tertiary level computer science. Um, but then another aspect that we've started to move into is K-12 digital technologies and STEM engagement. Um, but the work that we've been doing in tertiary has translated very much so into this space. And we take those key learnings and, and all that knowledge into the work that we do in the K-12 space. So in 2015, Australia endorsed a new K-12 computer science curriculum uh, called Digital Technologies. And this has been a really exciting development for our field, uh, but it does pose a number of challenges. And this includes teacher preparation, uh, the need for new pedagogy, particularly because it's introduced from the first year of school, as well as evidence-based practices that enable us to engage all learners um, in computer science. And so, what we're dealing with as well as um, quite a diverse cohort, so, um, and a large cohort, we have 220,000 primary teachers and 200, um, secondary, te 200 secondary teachers across Australia. And um, there are also challenges in terms of reaching remote and rural schools and a huge um, diversity in the, the availability of IT resources and infrastructure. Um, we also know that um, majority of teachers are female um, in the primary level and that most are generalist teachers and for many this is a brand new subject so they've never encountered computer science um, and a very very small fraction of them are specialist teachers in computer science. So within this curriculum students are exposed to computational thinking and that does include um, coding, and um, things like pattern recognition, abstraction, the use of algorithms, evaluation, and they're also looking at data, um, now um, aspects like cybersecurity and those kinds of considerations. So it's introduced from the very first year of school and this is a global movement as well. So we're seeing um, other countries around the world are also introducing this. And so it's an opportunity for our, our SCS education community to come together and really work to advance this new field. Um, but this isn't new. Uh, we can look to existing prior research that's been done. Professor um, Pappert was uh, an early writer around the use of programming as a way to engage students in computational thinking um, within mathematics. And so he used the uh, logo program and wrote books around this, around um, the value of having students engage in these types of activities um, in terms of their problem solving and engagement in mathematics. So when the curriculum rolled out, we were, it was also an unknown space in terms of what's available, um, what can we draw on? And so Katrina and I, uh, we're, we were funded through the Australian government to perform a desktop review looking at evaluating and identifying high quality K-12 CS learning and teaching resources. 
that could support classroom teachers across Australia. And this was also a, a gap analysis activity. So we were looking at what was out there, um, but then also providing recommendations around directions for where investment needed to be made to fill the gaps of a fully comprehensive holistic curriculum. So it's not just coding, um, programming in primary and secondary, it's a broader curriculum, including um, an understanding of data, um, information systems, evaluation, collaboration. It's, it's quite a broad curriculum. So um, we were looking at a gap analysis for that. And the, this report led to um, a key outcome, which was a, a number of NISA initiatives that the government invested in targeting those areas, including the creation of a digital technologies hub, which took the resources that we curated and also built out those gaps um, that we identified to provide support for teachers. Um, and Claudia Zabo is also undertaking research into K-12 programming environments. So she's worked with some national partners on looking at what's currently out there in terms of research in our understanding of programming environments, looking at um, visual programming and general purpose programming and where's the research at so that we can identify opportunities of where we could research and um, where to go with that direction. So this kind of work um, lays a strong foundation in terms of identifying the landscape at a point in time and also allowing for future analysis to explore trends. Um, and also this gap analysis allows us to um, you know, inform public policy, um, education policy and initiatives that that direct um, support for teachers and schools. So in response to the curriculum, uh, we were funded through uh, seed funding from Google Australia to support Australian teachers to um, roll out the curriculum in their schools. So we started with our very first foundations MOOC, which was looking at the very first year of school up until the end of primary school. And um, through this, since that, first course in 2014. Um, we've now rolled out a number of MOOCs which are on the screen here. So we um, have evolved to have an extended covering different year levels. So seven to eight and nine to 10. And now even moving into emerging areas. So we found, you know, a lot of teachers still need a lot of support from that foundational level. But we're also seeing teachers um, having sort of establish that foundation work and they're really keen to look at new emerging technologies and ways of introducing digital technologies in the classroom. So we've got teaching AI at the primary and secondary level and cyber security and awareness which have been funded through um, industry partners. And so all our MOOCs um, are self-paced, they're community driven models which I'll look at and they allow sustained open PD and um, altogether we've had um, just 30,000 teachers enroll in these MOOCs and the number is growing. So it's quite an attractive way for teachers to engage in these courses. Um, and part of the work that we do is to really look at how do you teach young children um, these kinds of concepts. So at, particularly at the primary level, it's a brand new area. And so we look at what resources are available, uh, what research says around how to teach these topics but then we also a lot of our research is developing um, new ways of teaching these concepts in plugged and unplugged ways and to trial them in these MOOCs and sort of evaluate and monitor how teachers engage with those activities. So when we came up with our um, MOOC model um, we didn't want to just make it a platform with just content and resources we really wanted to think about the design of scalable online learning so we looked at um, various models of engagement like communities of practice. We looked at different types of MOOCs like the connectivist and hybrid MOOCs. We looked at um, current teacher communities around sharing and collaboration, um, the Creative Commons licensing move movement, as well as models of teacher professional development and what teachers were saying that they, they needed. And all our MOOCs, um, if you're interested as well, I just thought to highlight they're available on our platform. So anyone can join, even um, yourselves, you can jump in and have a look at what, what are we doing at the, in this space? How do we teach these concepts? Um, it's free and open for anyone.
And so through our program, we created um, these MOOCs that are community driven, but we also built out a model, um, like an ecosystem of professional development. And through this, it's been, um, we rolled, started the program in 2014, and we've really, um, through iteration and analysis, we've developed a model of teacher professional development that works for us and what we've found has worked for schools. Um, but there's always opportunities to plug in new components to address needs. Um, so within our ecosystem, we've identified um, there's a need for supporting leadership and school champions. And this is conceptualized through our Peel in a Box program, which I'll show you. Um, we also have our MOOCs, which provide the um, authentic, flexible learning content that teachers need. And then through that, we've also found the value in face-to-face -face or online professional learning events. Um, and this provides that mentorship community building that teachers need to sustain their engagement. And then also um, we have a lending library, which provides um, technological pedagogical support um, through free loaning of equipment. Um, but it's not just handing equipment out to schools. A large part of it is understanding how, um, what effective pedagogy looks like with this equipment and how we can communicate that to teachers so that they use it in the best ways in the classroom. And within our ecosystem, we have um, developed uh, a really strong engagement with key stakeholders. So we couldn't have done it without our engagement with industry, outreach, academia, government, and other organizations. And so it's really about finding, um, we found this model is one that um, is really effective in getting a lot of people on board. With our MOOCs, we've also done some analysis and we found that um, our explore rate and engagement rate in our program is higher than the average. So we've got up to 29% of teachers coming into our MOOCs and staying engaged and participating, when usually that's around 15% for um, MOOCs. So we started um, with our MOOC in the foundations, but it's evolved. So um, I just thought I'd touch on the, the format of our MOOCs. So our MOOCs are designed around a community centric model that we've designed. And this is really embedded in social learning theory and social constructivism and our research into effective um, teacher PD models and needs. And so our MOOCs support this idea of context um, driven up resources, sustained and timely learning, um, a sense of community, allowing teachers for personalization and personal growth, and um, for them to connect the content to their professional practice through active learning activities. And so it's not just enough to have a community space, um, it needs to be purpose driven. And we found that through our early research. So we integrated these active learning tasks throughout the MOOCs, asking teachers to come and share learning activities um, based on the content that they've just learned as part of their assessments um, for a certificate. We also provide knowing that Australia is quite diverse in resources available. We um, have developed learning activities for low tech, no tech and high tech options so that schools who don't have readily um, available internet access can still engage in computational thinking in the classroom, just perhaps um, in an offline format. So this is an example of our community. Um, we've had thousands of resources generated by teachers and um, also a goal of that community aspect was to address a need, which was that there were a lack of um, CS education resources, particularly for the K-6 space and linked to our Australian curriculum. So by, de by designing our MOOCs with this community and those active learning tasks, we've now got um, you know, over 30,000 ideas being generated by teachers participating in our courses that are linked to the Australian curriculum that are relevant to Australian um, schools and that highlight the diversity of ways that teachers are integrating computer science in the classroom. Um, and we also allow, we've, the platform that we've selected allows for teachers to search the resources and we find that they continue to come back um, again and again to access them. So we've part of our research around um, the K-12 program has looked at 
exploring engagement within our online communities. So we really want to know, you know, is what we're delivering um, engaging teachers? Is it relevant? How are they connecting that to what they know and classroom practice? So this informs our understanding of online learning, particularly in teacher PD, but also from that we can extract from these communities of teachers their expertise and we can use that to inform and refine our own understanding of K-12 CS pedagogy. So um, within our online communities, we've been using frameworks like the technological pedagogical content knowledge framework um, to understand how teachers are contextualizing computer science and um, the different types of technologies and tools that they're using to deliver it. Um, we're now looking at um, taking that idea across to our artificial intelligence course. Um, I'm working with the Shari to automate some of that manual content analysis that we explored in this um, first foundations course. And what we can do also is by combining it with the teacher surveys that we have um, incoming and outgoing, um, we can combine content analysis with their survey responses, looking at how um, teacher self-efficacy impacts on perhaps or has a correlation with um, their use of technologies or the types of um, pedagogy that they're using in their classroom. And so it's quite, quite interesting to be able to sort of combine those and see how um, teachers are going. And so working with the Shari and Manasha and Katrina, um, we are also looking at teacher professional growth in online communities. And so we're using natural, we've used natural language processing techniques, um, looking at cognitive engagement of teachers. And this was combined with the ICAP framework. So looking at interactive, constructive and active and passive engagement. So different levels of engagement. Um, um, what we've been able to do is look at um, different types of knowledge that teachers are bringing into the course and how closely they align with the course content. So we've noticed that teachers have been um, connecting with the course content and then also contributing their own ideas, which are fresh new ideas to this space. Um, and we can sort of monitor that over time. We also have professional learning um, project officers, a team of wonderful people working on the ground around schools across Australia. Um, and what we've found is that professional learning support and engagement is so important for engaging teachers in the MOOCs. Um, they're there to build that grassroots community engagement and to help support teachers through their learning processes. And we're also having to adapt and explore new ways of delivering PD within these changing times. Um, we have a lending library, as I mentioned, which explores um, the pedagogy of using these technologies in the classroom. And we're currently um, sending out a survey to the teachers about their use of equipment. So we've had it running for some time now, and now we're quite keen to understand how teachers were using it and the impact on their practice and student learning. And also more of a deep dive into their classroom um, use of these technologies. We also um, have done some work looking at connecting what we're doing with the international community. So all around the world, we've got researchers also exploring CS education in their own context for primary and secondary years. And so in 2019, we've led um, a working group looking at developing an instrument that can measure um, intended curriculum, which is the predefined curriculum by you know, the education board, and then looking at what teachers are actually doing in the classroom. And so a lot of that work um, we've done is really around building that survey instrument to make sure it was um, internationally relevant as best as we could make it and to um, look at validating it as well. And so that provides an opportunity for that longitudinal analysis and monitoring. We also found that through um, teachers wanting to use our PD for grassroots professional learning, there was a real need to support different systems of engagement. And so we launched Peel in a Box with funding from um, Google. And we found that through looking at a systems approach of program evaluation, we can see different stakeholders are using and engaging in our program in different ways. So schools can actually define their own pathways, taking pieces of the program as they need it. 
And we're also seeing pre-service teacher programs using our resources because they're all Creative Commons um, licensing. We, we've noticed different models of teacher professional development in schools that are grassroots and being run by teachers as well, um, which is really interesting to inform our understanding. We've also been able to demonstrate through our program evaluation dif how different components of the program work together to um, sort of inform policy and rollout of curriculum. So we've seen that with our launch, we just had the MOOCs, um, but with an expansion of providing that professional development support and peel in a box, um, we had course completion rates um, rise and we also had our target cohort participation rate rise. So our target is low SES and rural remote um, schools. And then by adding that ecosystem layer with the lending library, um, our target cohort participation um, increased to almost 25%. And so through that types, types of layering, um, we're able to demonstrate the value of having that face-to-face -face support of having the technology in schools that you know, often don't have this equipment. Um, we're really interested as well in looking at the teacher experience, the teacher voice that comes through and how the design of our program can align with their needs. And so a lot of it is around you know, connecting with others who um, share similar experiences and looking at resources. And these comments kind of reflect back into our um, design goals um, around social connectivism and online learning. Um, we're also noticing that it's that access to online PD that is really valuable, particularly for um, remote areas. And we've come out with a number of um, program evaluation considerations that other organisations can take on as well when they're coming to look at teacher PD um, and particularly a national approach. <clears throat> And the model that um, we developed through that um, digital technologies program has now um, been the basis for a government grant supporting mathematics and numeracy education in schools, um, which we were very fortunate to have won with our partners at Education Services Australia. So now we're taking that um, ecosystem model and we're rolling it out for a new learning area, um, which will be really exciting to see how that translates. Um, but our research will also continue to look at, you know, is this the right model for the mathematics education community? Um, and we'll be monitoring and looking at how that evolves to address teacher needs and the community as well. We've also done within K-12, um, we've had funding from Education Services Australia to um, perform systematic reviews of assessment methods for K-12 computer science. And um, through that, we've developed frameworks to guide teachers. So um, in our work, we do the research, but we also look at how we can translate that and make it practical for schools and teachers. And so on the Digital Technologies Hub platform now, we have um, a framework based around Bloom's taxonomy as a way to help teachers design their own assessment um, products for K-12 computer science. And so a large part of that was um, it emerged out of teacher needs and also an identified need um, that teachers wanted support around how to design their own assessments, not just to be given the templates and told what to do, um, but it really empowering the teachers to find um, processes that help them. And we've also done some research as well around looking at teachers' self-efficacy in assessment and how that relates to curriculum implementation. Um, and of course, we found through practice and actually having those experiences, teachers are able to build, they have higher self-efficacy. And so part of professional development, we're recommending that um, assessment be built into teacher PD. And so we've gone back through our MOOCs as well and have embedded um, assessment as, uh, as a component within that professional development. So, a last area I thought to touch on was our work in STEM engagement. Um, so with STEM engagement, um, you know, we're quite interested in also broadening participation and seeing more diverse cohorts and excitement, enthusiasm in technology, um, particularly, but also other STEM areas. Um, and one area, one project that I undertook was in 2016, 
I received a fellowship from the Chief Executive Women and the Australian Government to travel around the world onto these, to these locations to interview leaders in STEM education, particularly around engaging girls and women. And so um, this was through interviews, uh, case study analysis, document analysis, and then um, it resulted in preparing a report for government. And it was really the outcomes we're looking at a systems approach to STEM engagement um, and Australia as having an ecosystem of STEM education engagement. And we provided eight recommendations to government, um, which are on the screen here, which many of them have been taken up and adopted and it's been able to inform policy and STEM engagement and it led to an initiative such as the um, Girls in STEM Toolkit platform which took a lot of those recommendations on board. Um, Claudia Zabo and Katrina Faulkner have also done some research as well around gen with um, the gender equity researchers at University of Adelaide looking at barriers and enablers in um, computer science education and they're also looking at it from that you know micro and macro system level and the different um, barriers and enablers that students and teachers are reporting around um, their engagement and participation in computer science. So bringing a lot of our work together, um, we recently, Katrina and I co-authored a chapter um, with Shuchi Grover um, which is a practical handbook for K-12 teachers about programming education. And our chapter looked at the, those knowledge, skills, attitudes and beliefs, um, these kind of underpinning um, essential ways of thinking um, that can support learning of programming in K-12. And um, what we love about this work is it's bringing the research that we've done to um, teachers in a practical way. So the goal of this book was to not have it research heavy, but to really make it tangible and practical for teachers. And I think um, it, it was just really nice to be able to disseminate a lot of what we've learned in STEM engagement and in K-12 um, CS education, as well as even in the work, early work in the tertiary space um, to sort of package that and present it together. Um, currently, I'm also working with Education Services Australia on building out um, a systematic review, looking at uh, classroom practices that can support inclusive STEM education. And this report will be released soon. And um, you know, something like that is going to help support teachers to bring a lot of that research into the classroom. So rather than high level recommendations, what are these kinds of tangible strategies that they can adopt immediately? Um, and it links to a lot of the resources and initiatives that have been um, carried out across Australia. So in summary, um, you know, a lot of the work we've been doing is really to inform our understanding of technology enhanced learning, but also how we can advance and improve learning and teaching in K-12 and tertiary CS education. Um, and I hope that you've seen like how we're working together to solve these problems um, in different ways, bringing together learning sciences and our various expertise. Um, I'd love to open up for opportunities for collaboration as well. Um, now that you have an idea of what we're doing in this space, there, there are things that we're interested in, in terms of developing and evaluating um, the development of technologies in, grounded within these learning theories looking at investigating how people learn with and without technology and it could be exploring new techniques whether that be computer vision or um, you know data science techniques there's a, a whole host of opportunities there um, also looking at new modes of assessing learning so online scalable learning or whether that be physically in the classroom as well as um, really we want to push and advance the k-6 education cs education pedagogy work um, you know we are leading the international space in this with a number of other international collaborators. And lastly, we're always keen to hear your ideas. So please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, I haven't touched on everything today because I do think some of our um, CS education researchers deserve their own spotlight because the depth and breadth of their work is also warrants their own presentation too. Um, so thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions or um, take them offline if you'd like to chat to us. Yeah, 
thank you very much, um, Rebecca, for your fantastic presentation, really um, amazing.